glad to be here with Lawrence Livermore. I managed to get in past the security, and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the status of the composite haze. So before we start, we should keep in mind the big picture, right, which is uh, uh, why we're interested in this subject is because of the hierarchy problem. And we really just have three paradigms that we know of to address the hierarchy problem, okay? And the one I'm going to be talking about is uh, the so-called dynamical paradigm. Here the idea is, is that a natural way to generate scales, which we uh, observe often in nature, is that some coupling becomes strong and then something interesting happens, okay? And uh, so this is the one paradigm for the solution of the hierarchy problem that has been unambiguously observed in nature. The paradigm is uh, QCD, paradigm, paradigm, paradigm is QCD. Um, however, if we're trying to use this to say something about the Higgs, uh, well, we have to face the fact that the 125 GeV particle that was discovered at the LHC looks a lot like a standard model Higgs. Okay? And so in this talk, I want to talk about what options may be left for a composite Higgs. So I'm going to be talking about various possibilities, and I'll just start with uh, uh, the Higgs as uh, a sigma-like resonance. So the question is, could it be just an accident that the Higgs looks like, a, 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 the, the, the observed particle looks like the standard model Higgs, could it just be some composite scalar? Okay. And so what we assume is that there's some theory that breaks electroweak symmetry dynamically, like technicolor, and the Higgs is just a light a composite that just happens to be light. Okay. So uh, for theories like this, if we have some scale lambda, which is the scale of strong electroweak symmetry breaking, we have some way of writing down the terms in the Lagrangian, and we know how to estimate them from the fact that the theory should get strong at the scale lambda. And so that's called naive dimensional analysis, and this thing contains a mass for the sigma, cubic terms, W and Z masses from strong dynamics, couplings of the sigma to the Ws and Zs, and so on. Now the first point is, is that to get the mass of the Ws and Zs right, we need the scale lambda to be about 4 pi V, which is about 3 TeV. And that is uh, also, that scale of 3 TeV is also what we get by scaling up the uh, row mass in QCD. So that uh, tells us this NDA is not a bad thing. Now this paradigm has lots of problems. In the 80s, it was shown to have various flavor problems of the UV completion. In the 2000s, we found out that higher dimension operators are, uh, are, are, are precision electroweak measurements are very marginal in this theory. And in the 2010s, we have a Higgs discovery. So it seems like this theory should be completely down and out. How down and out is it? Well, here I want to just focus on uh, the tuning of these parameters, or how these parameters, uh, whether these parameters are expected to describe uh, the Higgs that we've observed, the state that we've observed. So the first point is that, of course, the, this resonance was unexpectedly light, okay? So it's expected to have a mass of order lambda, okay? And so there's some accident uh, that it is lighter, that it's 125 GV instead. Okay, so how should we think about this? Because, you know, if you have some theory on the lattice, you might just find, by, for no reason that you can tell, that there is a light scalar uh, that's much lighter than the scale of the other composites. Okay, but I would say that there would still be some sort of an accident or unexplained suppression, which is of order the square of the mass over the, the, the expected mass, and that's about 0.1%. Okay. Now, how should I think about some unexplained suppression like that? In my mind, it's conceptually no different from a tuning. It's, there's no parameter that's being finally adjusted. However, there's some accident that we expect it to happen very rarely because of some uh, accidental cancellation. And the best estimate for the chance of that happening is about 0.1%. So I'm just going to regard that sort of thing as a tuning throughout this talk. But there's actually more than this. This is, this is not the worst, this is not all, okay? Because in addition to getting the mass light enough, you also need to make sure that the cubic coupling is not too large. The cubic coupling is a relevant uh, perturbation, and it has to be suppressed even to just avoid unitarity violation down to the scale mh of this resonance. And that means that this, if you work it out, that this cubic coupling has to be suppressed by about 4% compared to its expected value, just requiring that it doesn't violate unitarity at the scale MH. Okay? This bound can probably be strengthened a bit, but I'm not going to bother to do that. 
And finally, you also have to account for the fact that the observed Higgs couplings are close to the standard model values. And because, for example, the Higgs coupling to vectors is measured to 10%, this theory predicts that the order of magnitude of that coupling is right, that it's, but there should be order 100% correction. So this is, again, a 10% accident or 10% tuning. And there's about a 20% tuning in the, the, the fermion couplings. And all of these are <coughs> independent accidents. They could have happened one without the other. All of them are completely independent of each other. And so the total tuning is about 10 to the minus 6. It's 1 in a million if you put it all together. Okay? So I'm going to be telling you my personal verdict on all of these things. And so my personal verdict of this is that it's just like a unicorn. Okay? It's very hard to disprove the existence of a unicorn, but it's we. Based on what we know, it seems incredibly unlikely, and so I'm not going to go personally go hunting for unicorns. So, Mark, is it my picnic day talk? I yeah. use a platypus. A platypus. Yeah, well, that's the difference. Right. Is that we know that they exist. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, we can have that. Dis that one can have discussions on all of these, but this is this is certainly my opinion. Okay. So that's that's one possibility. Okay. Another possibility, which has some more. Um, theoretical oomph to it, some more plausibility, is the Higgs, uh, when I put Higgs in quotes, I mean the observed 125 GeV state, the observed 125 GeV state as a biliton, okay? And the reason that this is not uh, a silly idea is that in the, if you look at the standard model, the VEV of the Higgs is pretty much the only mass scale there is in the theory. It is the only mass scale in the Lagrangian because if you can trade it for the mass of the Higgs itself, okay, they're tradable parameters. But the VEB of, in the Lagrangian, the VEB of H is really the only mass scale. But there's some additional scale dependence from the scale dependence of loops. But that's smaller, right? That's a preservative correction. So in the standard model, the VEB of H is uh, pretty much the only mass scale. And that means that it already is a lot like a dilaton. A dilaton is something that spontaneously breaks scale invariance. Here, the VEV of the H breaks scale invariance. And so the Higgs is not a bad, is, is actually not so far from being a dilaton in the standard model. So maybe the observed states that, state that we see is like that. Okay? So the sort of setup that we imagine is that we assume that conformal symmetry is spontaneously broken at some high scale, maybe a TeV scale or something, by some strong dynamics. Okay? And, some, and so that generates a uh, Nambu Goldstone boson, a dilaton, and it has some shift symmetry like this, but also the, the, the coordinates scale. Right? That's the sign that this is scale invariance that's being broken. Okay? And then if we, do, if we have that, we can combine it into a scalar like this. Uh, basically, e to the tau is something that transforms like an ordinary scalar under um, scale transformations. Okay, at an ordinary dimension one scalar. Okay. And then the assumption that scale symmetry is spontaneously broken is we assume that all mass scales in the effective theory are proportional to the VEV of phi. Okay. So then, for example, uh, the mass of the W is actually proportional to phi squared. The mass of the top is proportional to phi and so on. Right. And that's exactly what we get in the standard model where phi is a Higgs. We also get this kind of coupling right here. Okay. So we see that if we have a dilaton, it couples to mass just the way that a standard model Higgs does. Okay, so that's why this is not, this is an interesting idea, right? This is the, this, the, the, but this thing, this phi needs to have nothing to do at all with electroweak symmetry breaking. Okay? Now, what I'm going to explain is that there are two problems with this. One is a tuning problem, which is exactly analogous to the tuning problem that I talked about before. And the other is that if you want to avoid this tuning, or at least some of it, you have to require a very special structure in the UV theory. Okay. So the problem with dilaton tuning has to do with the fact that uh, unlike ordinary Goldstone bosons, uh, the, 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 the dilaton is allowed to have a potential if it's exactly quartic. Okay? And you can understand that from the fact that the coefficient kappa of this thing is uh, dimensionless. Right? A quartic coupling of a scalar is dimensionless. And so this is allowed by scale symmetry, okay? or conformal symmetry. And because it's allowed by scale symmetry, it should be unsuppressed. This coefficient should not be suppressed at all, which means that it's something like 4 pi squared in a strongly interacting theory. Okay. 
And so, what are the so uh, we expect this thing to be to be uh, to be strong uh, to, be, to be strong, but then this is bad because another requirement that we have, if we really want this thing to couple this phi to couple like a Higgs, right? What we have to do is we have to expand around its VEV, which is F, right? F is not V in general. F is just whatever because this this dilaton has nothing to do with electroweak symmetry breaking, so it can have any VEV that it wants. So we expand around F and we expand linearly. And then if we look at the coupling to Ws, for example, the linear coupling goes like Mw squared over F, right? But in the standard model, it would go like Mw squared over V, all right? And we, not V, but this coupling has been measured. This is the most accurately measured Higgs coupling, in fact, okay? And so what we need is we need this F to be equal to V to order 10% to explain the observed Higgs couplings, okay? And so, uh, but however, large lambda means small VEV, right? Because we have, we've measured the mass of the state. The mass of the state is 125 GeV. If kappa is large, the VEV will come out way too small. So it's, we will get not even to 10%, we'll get something completely off, right? We'll get much too large a coupling, in fact, okay? And so uh, there's, a, there's, again, some tuning or some accident, whatever you want to call it, and that's estimated by the allowed range of this kappa to get this to within 10% divided by the expected value, which is 4 pi squared, and that's, again, less than a percent. It's 0.5%. Marcus, Mark, yeah. you said that it would be strongly coupled, and so that ratio is kind of 1 on the order of unity. So why, why strong and not, you know... Like alpha. Okay, so you know, the, but I, no, it, it it does matter. Okay, so you the, the the you came in just a little bit late. The context of this is that this is a talk that I'm giving to a lattice workshop. Okay, so it's specifically about you know whether strong dynamics could have something to do with electroweak symmetry breaking. But you're right. You could have you could try to make a more weakly coupled theory. In fact, that's one direction you could you could try to pursue. Okay. It turns out that has difficulties as well, but um, you know you could you could try to do it. Just so you could try to do that. Okay. But yeah, I'm assuming that for the whole talk, not just for this this part of it. Okay. And so um, the thing about this is that uh, once I've done this tuning, right, the same tuning actually explains uh, the other coupling. So that's one tuning, and I get all the Higgs coupling once I've once I've done this tuning. Okay. Um, except for the loop-induced couplings, because there's an additional, remember, there's an additional scale dependence coming from loops. The loop scale dependence doesn't have to match the tree-level one, okay? This is much more model-dependent, and so I'm not going to really talk about it. It's anyway pretty small, small change compared to this tuning, which is, which is much more severe, okay? So my verdict on this is that I do not like it. Okay, so I I, uh, I think that this is an unacceptable level of accident or, or tuning. That's my personal opinion. Okay, now um, so uh, the 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 thing is is that that the the if we want to we can try to avoid this. Remember the the problem was to to explain why this kappa was small. So maybe there's a UV theory where we can explain where kappa is small, but that would require some special structure. Okay. Um, and before, sorry, before we even talk about that, uh, we should talk about the fact that if we're try I'm trying to understand what kinds of UV physics could even give us a dilaton, right? We need to understand what we need, okay? And the first ingredient that we know we need is conformal invariance. We need scale invariance in the, in the, in the UV theory, okay? But that's not enough. But let me first say, how, how can we imagine getting uh, scale invariance? One way, the, the original way that people talked about in the starting in the 1980s, is that you have an asymptotically free gauge theory. So this is the, the renormalization scale, and this is the gauge coupling. And so the gauge coupling is asymptotically free, so it increases as you go to the infrared, just as it does in the standard QCD. But then when it, when it gets strong, instead of keeping going up, it actually levels off for a while before going up. Okay, so it has this sort of swervy S-shaped thing, okay? And you can argue about whether this is plausible or not, but anyway, this is something that people, a scenario that people thought about for a long time. Um, another scenario you could think about, which is can, can perhaps a little bit more robustly be realized, is that you can imagine that in the UV, you have a UV fixed point at a non-zero value of the gauge coupling. We certainly know of theories like that. And then it blows up at some scale lambda just because there is a relevant perturbation added to the theory. Okay? So if this, 
if this perturbation were not added, the coupling would stay at this fixed point forever, but this explicit perturbation here just makes it blow up. Okay? But in either of these cases, you have some region above the scale lambda where the coupling, gauge coupling doesn't run, and so you have scale invariance. Okay? However, this scale invariance is certainly not enough to have a dilaton, okay? because the conformal symmetry is explicitly broken at the scale lambda in both cases. As you can see just from the fact that the coupling is running very, very quickly. The whole point is that the scale, is, the scale lambda is defined at the place where the coupling is running very quickly. So at the scale, there is no trace of conformal invariance left. It's just explicitly broken. Okay? And so we do not expect to have any light dilaton. <coughs> so this picture suggests, though, how we can get uh, a dilaton, which is that we need approximate conformal symmetry at the scale lambda. Okay? So at the scale lambda, even though the coupling is getting strong or something interesting is happening there, we need to have approximate uh, conformal symmetry. And the way to do that, it turns out, is to break the conformal symmetry with an operator that has dimension nearly 4. Okay? So such an operator does not break conformal invariance except for a little tiny bit, and that will actually turn out to work. Okay? So this is something that has been discussed by a number of authors, one of whom is here in the room, and so I'm just going to review what they, what they said. Okay? So the idea is that we add an operator with dimension nearly 4, so its coefficient has some beta function which is small. Okay? So there's a small parameter epsilon in the game, which is how close, how close this thing is to being perfectly dimensionless. Okay? And then what happens is if we look at this coupling kappa, it actually depends on the value of lambda. Right? Different values of lambda are different theories. Right? And so the value of the coupling kappa in the effective theory depends on the value of lambda in the fundamental theory. Okay? And it depends on the value of lambda renormalized at the scale phi, because phi is setting all the mass scales of the theory. So I have something like this, that the V effective is kappa of lambda of phi times phi to the fourth. Okay? And so now I can just take these equations here and I can minimize the potential. Okay? And I assume that this kappa goes through zero. The crucial assumption is that I assume that this kappa, which is a function of lambda, which is a function of phi, goes to zero at some critical value of lambda star, where all this description is valid, and that this lambda is some lambda corresponding to a renormalized phi of a phi at some particular value of phi star. Okay? Now with this assumption, you can find that there is a minimum where kappa is small, which is what I needed. Right? So you just do minimization of the potential, okay? and you find that lambda is equal to lambda star plus order epsilon corrections. The VEV of phi is close to phi star, and kappa is suppressed by epsilon. Okay? So you find that you have the features that you need. Okay? So now this thing that I gave the thumbs down for is actually solved, right? If I have all of these things. So if I, can, if I have epsilon something like... Um, Actually, I think I need 10 to the minus 2 here. I think that's a typo. I need epsilon to be like 10 to the minus 2, and then I will find that phi is of order... Um, no, I think it is... I'm a little confused. Uh, up to, I think it's 10 to the minus... Is it 10 to the minus 1? No, I think it's 10 to the minus 2. I think it's 10 to the minus 2. Okay, anyway, I'll sort that out. But it's, uh, you, with some value of epsilon, you can get something that looks like... Uh, order of magnitude looks like a Higgs. Okay? So the only thing is that you still need about 10% tuning because you need this to be spot on the standard model value. So you still have something like 10% tuning. And maybe there's some extra tuning, comparable tuning from these other loop effects. And so my uh, take, personal take on this is that maybe it's okay. I don't know. It uh, doesn't get me excited, but it's, uh, it's, it's, not, as, it's not so ridiculous. So now, suppose that you wanted to study this on the lattice, right? Then, uh, then you have to face the fact that you require a theory with very special structure. So as I've just tried to explain, the theory must have a fixed point that has a nearly dimension 4 operator. In a strongly coupled theory, that is very non-generic. So you have to get lucky to find that, okay? And then if you find that, you, the phase diagram on the lattice depends on a new parameter, which is the 
coupling of this thing. It depends on a new dimensionless parameter that is probably not apparent in your, in your action. If you just have some Wilson action with some fermions, for example, you, you, this, the, the fact that you have hid, this hidden parameter is not visible to you. And uh, it means that if you change things in your UV action, you might find a totally different uh, low energy theory or dynamics. And so it's gonna, it would be very, very challenging to study these guys on the, on the lattice. Okay, so that's all I had to say about that. Okay? All right, so then the, the, next, uh, the next thing that I want to talk about is the, uh, the Higgs as a pseudo Nyberg Goldstone boson. Okay? And so pseudo Nyberg Goldstone bosons are certainly, unlike the previous things I've talked about, dilatons or very light composite states from a strong sector. We've never seen such things. We've certainly seen pseudo Nyberg Goldstone bosons. We have pions in QCD. So this one has uh, certainly uh, seems like a promising direction to go. So here the idea is that we have some strong sector that has a global symmetry G spontaneously broken down to H. That gives us some Nyberg Goldstone bosons that live in the coset G mod H. And if this G symmetry is exact, we have massless Nyberg Goldstone bosons with derivative couplings. Now, to get make this a theory of electroweak symmetry breaking, what we do is we first of all have a theory where the electroweak symmetry group is embedded in this global symmetry. That means that the the quarks, if you like, of this new strong sector are coupled to the to the standard model gauge bosons, and we assume that this theory, unlike uh, Technicolor, this theory has an electroweak preserving vacuum. Okay? So somewhere, so these pions, there's some set of vacuum, which is like the bottom of a Mexican hat, which I've drawn here. So this is schematically the, bo the, the bottom ridge of the Mexican hat. And in some places on the bottom of the Mexican hat, like here, electroweak symmetry is preserved. On other places, however, it's broken. So I've labeled this the electroweak vacuum, where electroweak symmetry is preserved, and the technicolor vacuum, where it's broken. Okay? And the radius of this circle is f. So f is the VEV that's dynamically induced in the strong sector. But the theory could live either here or here. Okay? Now what decides where it lives is the fact that this bottom of this Mexican hat is not perfectly flat. It's actually tilted. It's tilted partly by the electroweak interactions themselves and other interactions that explicitly break G. Okay? But anyway, what we do is we, we hope that those interactions can make the theory live not precisely at the electroweak preserving point, but nearby, okay, here. And the reason for that is that if we think about fluctuations about this thing right here, these fluctuations are precisely a Higgs, because as you turn on these fluctuations, they will break electroweak symmetry. Okay? So if you work out the theory around a, a, a vacuum like this, this electroweak vacuum, you'll find that some of your Nabra Goldstone bosons are exactly like Higgs bosons. And so what you would like is a vacuum where the angle here, so basically, if you like, V is F sine theta, right? So F is the radius here, so the projection of this onto the braking axis is the, uh, the electroweak braking VEV. And you would like to find a VEV that has uh, the, the theta, which is small, so that this thing behaves like a Higgs, and so you need V much smaller than F. Okay? So this is the basic idea of the pseudo Nandu Boltzmann boson Higgs. Now, the, the problem with this is that it also requires some <coughs> tuning. Okay? It requires tuning, if you want V to be much smaller than F, it requires a tuning like this that goes like V squared over F squared. Okay, or it requires something like little Higgs structure, which is I'm not going to discuss, which is a very rather elaborate theoretical structure, which you could also try to, to, to use. Okay. And so the question is, uh, it's a very important question, how much smaller than F do you need V to be? Okay? And that comes from the fact that if you look at the couplings of the uh, uh, if you look at the coupling of this state to the vectors, it turns out that it's equal to the standard model only when you have v much smaller than f, right? But the corrections are of order v squared over f squared. In other words, the corrections are just as big as the tuning parametrically, okay? And so the fact that you've measured this to be the standard model to 10% is telling you that the tuning is of order 10%. So one interesting thing in this scenario is as the precision Higgs measurements get better and better, they are directly forcing the tuning in this scenario to be stronger and stronger. Okay, so in this scenario, another way to say it, in this scenario, you expect to find a deviation. 
and the Higgs coupling is right around the corner. Okay, so that's interesting. Okay, so 10% tuning uh, is not so bad if that were the end of it. Unfortunately, it's not quite the end of it. Uh, you also have top loops. Okay, and top loops are generally sensitive to this scale lambda. The top coupling is big, so this loop suppression is not much of a suppression. And now remember, the scale lambda is bigger because f is about three times bigger than v, so this is about 10 TeV rather than 3 TeV. And so this thing, that enhances this. And so you find that top loops give you a very large correction to the Higgs mass. And if you just cancel this by some additional tuning, you need an additional 2% tuning or so. Okay. So this, uh, taken together, would not be very, uh, would not be a very uh, acceptable state of affairs. But there's another possibility. There's a way to avoid the second tuning right here, which is to have top partners with a mass below the scale lambda. Okay. So let me uh, explain what that is. Here, uh, the idea is that we have, in, in addition to the top, we, have, we add some top partners, enough so that we fill out these multiplet of these large global symmetries. Okay? And that then reduces the breaking of this global symmetry G in the loops of the tops and the top partners. And so instead of having MH squared proportional to lambda, we have MH squared proportional to the mass of the top. So this is very analogous to the, the, the similar thing in supersymmetry, where the top and the stop loops are cut off by the stop mass. You have a very similar effect here, where these top partner masses cut off the loop contributions to the Higgs uh, mass. Okay? So it's exactly the same idea, actually. And this requires these top partner masses to be less than about a TeV for naturalness, just like for the stops. Okay? And just like for the stops, that means that these, are, these colored top partners are observable at the LHC. And certainly, searching for those is, uh, is, is, is an ongoing uh, activity. Okay? Okay, so this is, uh, so here we, we have to now address, however, how flavor works, okay? There are two kinds of things that you can consider, partial compositeness or Yukawa type flavor. Um, I'm going to focus on uh, partial compositeness, okay? So here the idea is that uh, we have the, 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 um, the left-handed quark, the right-handed top, the right-handed bottom, and actually you need to have also the top partners, which I'm not indicating here. But those things are coupled to some uh, fermionic operators, psi, capital T, and capital B. And these are gauge singlet fermion operators in the strong sector. So they could be things like baryon operators, three quark operators, for example, in the strong sector. Okay? And so the, the mixing of these things, the composite in the elementary states, can break the flavor symmetries. And we will find, we'll find at the end of the day that the top quark is proportional to the product of these z's, you know, corresponding to the, 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 the standard model states that we're trying to give mass to. Okay. And one nice thing about this is that uh, the unitarity bound on the dimensions of these composite operators is that they have to have a dimension larger than that of an elementary fermion, which is three halves. And that means that these z's, these couplings, may be nearly marginal or irrelevant. They don't have to be higher dimension operators suppressed by a high mass scale. And so we don't necessarily have any flavor problems like we did in Technicolor, where we had to use higher dimension operators to generate, um, to generate uh, flavor. Okay? So this, is, this kind of framework, I would say, I would give a thumbs up to. Okay? So you need to have, uh, there are some, definitely some non-trivial ingredients you need, but this is something which has been studied by many people, and this is something that works pretty well. And all you have at the end of the day is this 10% tuning, this 10% accident in the Higgs couplings, but it's a single accident. Question. Yeah. Could you elaborate what do you mean by partial? So what I mean by that is that because of these couplings right here, because of these couplings right here, the observed states that we see are actually a mixture of these composite states and the elementary fermions, right? This is a mixing type mass. So the actual mass eigenstate will be a linear combination of these things. Okay? All right. So there, of course it can't be, there are some limits on how composite it can be, but it turns out that you can satisfy all of those. So this is still, this is allowed. Okay. So if you wanted to study this on the lattice, there are quite a few requirements. 
First of all, you need to have these composite fermion operators. They need to be, these operators need to be there in your theory, and they have to have the quantum numbers of the elementary fermions, at least the quarks of the third generation, okay, for naturalness. And you would like the dimensions of these fermion operators not to be too big. If they were too big, you would have ETC-like problems. So ideally, you would really like them to be uh, around five halves, okay, if you could, or smaller. Um, the, uh, also, you need to have, remember, these top partners, what are these top partners now? These top partners are actually these composite states now, right? And so you would like those to have, uh, to, to have, to be, uh, have light masses, right? Okay? And so there are, there are theories that are candidates for this. There are ordinary, there are sim relatively simple gauge theories that satisfy the, at least the requirements that they have the, the, the composite operators in them, and they have a, the possibility of having a vacuum that preserves electroweak symmetry and violates <coughs> electroweak symmetry. So you need all of those things. And you can hear some examples. One of them is, uh, let's say, SO5 gauge theory with four four-dimensional representations. These are spinners of SO4 and six fundamentals of SO5. Sorry, SO5. These are spinners of SO5 and fundamentals of SO5. Or you could have SU4 gauge theory with five uh, sixes, which are anti-symmetric tensors. Are those sixes? Yeah. Yes, I think that's right. And uh, what are threes? I think, I think these are supposed to be four plus four bars. Three fundamentals plus anti-fundamentals. Okay? So anyway, there you can read about these here, but there are some, there are some theories that satisfy all of these requirements. Okay? Okay, I think I'm probably not going to have time for this, but uh, I, could, I could talk about it here. Um, so I, I can see that I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to cut this down. But All right, let me just, since I made the slides, I'll just talk about it here. Um, uh, <clears throat> partial Higgs compositeness is another uh, idea where you could try to have uh, composite, you know, strong dynamics uh, play some role in the Higgs sector. And here the idea is that the observed Higgs is a mixture of the elementary of elementary and composite states. Okay, so if I, since I have an elementary Higgs state in the theory, the only sensible framework for that is supersymmetry. Okay, so a lot of people probably are falling asleep at this point anyway. So this is why I have to, uh, they don't they don't like supersymmetry, of course, right? Um, because they can't put it on the lattice. Right? So anyway, uh, uh, nothing personal. So. Um, so why, if we have supersymmetry, why are we talking about any compositeness? Why there's no more problem, right? Everybody tells you that supersymmetry already solves every problem. Um, I literally heard that line from a, from a European experimentalist as he said, Susie solves all problems in particle physics. So I know it's true, okay? If experimentalists are saying it in official talks, it must be true. Um, but actually there is, there's, us theorists are still worrying a little bit about the fact that in supersymmetry, the quartic coupling of the Higgs is, is, is not so, so small. So now why is it so large? It's not big enough. Okay, supersymmetry generically predicts that the quartic coupling is not big enough. That's the problem. It's one problem that we have in supersymmetry. Okay, so that you could so having the Higgs be a mixture of elementary and composite states may be a way to, to address this question, okay, as we'll see. Now, if you have uh, both supersymmetry and composite dynamics, you have to ask the question, well, why are they both there at the same scale, at the TEV scale, right? Isn't that just a coincidence? The TEV scale is the scale of steady <coughs> breaking. Why is it also the scale of strong dynamics? That would be some unexplained coincidence. And the way we can address that is by, uh, if we can call it super conformal technicolor, here the idea is that in the above the scale, above the Susie breaking scale, the theory is at some strong fixed point. Okay, so we know theories like this where the, 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 the there's some sector and it's some supersymmetric sector that has a gauge coupling that is large but doesn't run. Okay, then Susie breaking sets the scale for some relevant perturbations, and then what happens since the theory is already strong when this perturbation happens. It just breaks supersymmetry and gets strong right at the same at the Susie breaking scale. Okay, so in this kind of model, there is no problem about why these scales are the same. Okay, now what kind of problem can this solve? Well, one this can lead to one very interesting type of uh, model, which I've worked quite a bit on, um, 
where you break electroweak symmetry in some strong sector of this kind that I just showed, and that induces the VEV for the elementary Higgs. Okay? So what I mean by that is that the Higgs has a, quartic, a quadratic term, okay? and then it has some linear term. Um, normally, I can't write a linear term for the Higgs by gauge invariance, right? but electroweak gauge invariance has already been broken in the strong sector. So after I've integrated out the heavy fields in the strong sector, I can write a coupling like this where the Higgs couples to the, basically the, the Nandu Goldstein bosons that are generated from the strong sector. Okay? Now, uh, if I just had these two terms, what I would get is I would just get a shifted parabola. Right? Instead of the Higgs potential having this nice double well shaped, it's a shifted parabola. Okay? That's all it is. Okay? So the idea is that this Higgs, the Higgs mass term is positive. So if I didn't have this term, electroweak symmetry would not break. Okay? And uh, I've neglected the quartic terms, but that's exactly what Susie wants to do. I told you that Susie uh, predicts that the, two, the quartic is too small. So I'm just neglecting it. Okay? And so this is a very, very different kind of potential. It's a very different realization of electroweak symmetry breaking than in the standard model or in the MSSM. And this is... Uh, called induced electroweak symmetry breaking. Okay? And so in this theory, the observed VEV of the Higgs, 246 GeV, is the, if the square of it is the sum of the square of the F, the SUSY breaking in the, so, sorry, the electroweak breaking in the strong sector, plus the VEV of this H, which is induced like this. Okay? And of course, since I made, you know, worked on these models, I give those thumbs up. Okay. Um, on the lattice, this is extremely difficult because you, have to, you would have to look at a superconformal theory with SUSY breaking. So this would be extremely, extremely hard to do. And so that's all I have to say about it. Okay, so my conclusions are that this uh, Higgs compositeness requires some combination of dynamical accidents and very special UV theories, uh, which makes them very hard to study on the lattice. And perhaps the most promising directions are pseudo nandu goldstein boson higgs models. Okay, so that was my talk. And that was well over a half an hour. <laughs> so I guess I need to cut about a third of it. So. Yeah, it's 37 minutes. 37 minutes? Oh, okay. So maybe I'll, I'll definitely just leave out the... Uh, so when the lattice people want to do something, what kind of thing they, they want to calculate using lattice? What do they actually do? Yeah, or what do they want to do for, for this? Well, so the thing is, is that, you know, what they can, what they, what they do, I think it's, it's, to be honest, it's probably more driven by what they can do. Right, so they can, but they, they can study theories with different gauge groups, different numbers of fermions, and so on. You know, and uh, um, you know there are people that are part of the reason for this talk is that, I mean, in this there are people whispering in their ear that Technicolor is still alive, and so very simple theories are phenomenologically relevant for the LHC. And as I, this talk is my attempt to say, explain why that's not true. So. Some of their reasons are really bad reasons. They're listening to people who are telling them that Technicolor is alive and well. Mm -hmm. But the kinds of things that they can, they can easily calculate on the lattice, they can calculate um, the spectrum of, of massive particles. Right? Um, they can try to see whether a theory is conformal or not, has a strong fixed point or not. Um, I think that's pretty much the state of the art. There's not a lot. You know, it's hard, but for example, for these for these pseudo nandu goldstein boson Higgs right. models, they could definitely measure the dimensions of some composite operators. So they could basically yeah. measure the anomalous dimensions and see if they're favorable for this kind of physics. Um, they could also measure the masses of these composite baryon-like states. Those are things that are very feasible to do on the lattice. So, for example, like there are things like for the ASMPT parameter that because of strong dynamics, we don't really know what's the actual size of those. Right, they right. No, they, could, they could do those as well, that's true. They could mm -hmm. do those as well. Um, usually in these models, once you make it look like the standard model by some tuning and or special structure, those problems start going away, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I would say that 
the combination of precision electroweak and the Higgs coupling measurements tell us we have to be talking about well, some of these special theories. And then in these special theories, you know, they're, they're special precisely so that those things don't matter as much. Hmm. But, the, but here I haven't talked about S and T. I mean, S and T are, are I always, they, even in Technicolor, S and T, I believe, are marginal. So it's true that a lattice calculation could tell you, might tell you that S is a factor of three smaller than in QCD. That would be totally enough to make it completely allowed, okay? So that would be worth doing if those theories were viable for other reasons. But I don't think they are, right? Because we've seen the Higgs. <laughs> so that's it. Time to stop, right? Where did the factor of one third come from when you say that these, these Fermi operators have to be uh, less than one third the mass of the rows? Well, there I was assuming. I guess I guess it's not um, it's not true in all models. I guess so. I think what I was uh, yeah I was as I was talking I was realizing I don't think that's that may not be correct because what I was uh, there what I was keying in on was. Just, it was just this factor, sorry, here. It's just the fact that the top partners have to be light compared to a TEB, okay? Um, oh, and, and then you say that the right. right. But the thing is, I guess it could be also that the, if, they, if these things fill out complete multiplets, it's the light top partners. So if those are all elementary states, if you have a complete set of elementary states, then perhaps you don't need that. And then, I mean, so what you meant is really, also smaller than, than, than the scale of, of the, I mean, than the strong state scale. And then the mass of the row is not actually, this could even be lower. I mean, the row could be also light by accident. Yeah, I what I really some. mean, I, yeah, I should have used F as the comparison. Okay, maybe, yeah. I should have used F as the comparison. You're right, because okay. F is the thing that's required to be yeah, large. Exactly. So I should have used uh, something like four pi F. For like people, maybe uh, they are interested in seeing that's right. how, how rows. Yeah, they should really relate. That's right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. No, you're, you're right. I'll, I'll correct that. <coughs> Any more questions from Marcus? No, there's things Marcus again.